going to a Christian school. Growing up kind of as a kid, God was the first thing in my life that I cared about. That, and I went into this phase of, if this is what I'm getting for my effort to be a good Christian, then I'm just going to go full force into going and getting what I want. My relationship with God at the time was very strained. I was going through a really rough time with um, depression. I struggled with pornography a lot, and I just accepted I don't know how to change myself, and I prayed about it, and God won't change me to make me stop doing it, and so I just continued. I had a lot of mixed emotions about my relationship with Sam. He was actually pretty honest right up at front and told me he was struggling with pornography. I was very naive about a lot of things and didn't know how it would translate to real life relationships. Starting out in our relationship with Zoe, I was pressuring her more and more to be more and more physical. I was very hesitant because of how I was raised. I kind of wanted to save everything till marriage and yet at the time, I was going through such a crisis of faith and everything that as I got to know Sam more and became more attached and more in love and everything, I went more with what I might desire as opposed to what I knew was right. So it was spring of my senior year, spring of Zoe's junior year. Right. She was 20 and I was 21. And in mid-February, we um, found out, that, found out that I was pregnant. I dropped out of college to go plan for the wedding. We got married that June. The transition from college life, sleeping in and staying up late and having a community of friends, to living with Zoe's parents, having a newborn baby, and me needing to look for a job and all of this was just disorienting. I was still coping with all of the shame and all of the guilt of getting pregnant without being married. And um, I was diagnosed with uh, postpartum depression. Very shortly after Mariel was born, um, I decided to go to this group at Dolner Hospital for moms who were struggling with depression and anxiety. And um, while I was there, um, I actually met a woman who went to Travel Street, and she invited us to her small group. It was a lot of young people who were young parents with kids. I'm like, awesome, this is what we need. We could feel some hope, some more hope. My main coping mechanism continued to be pornography and keeping secrets from Zoe. And I hit that point of, I've finally taken it too far, and I made a decision that I was going to just go tell Zoe my anxiety was spiking a lot. And because Travel Street had been such a great resource in the past and a really wonderful place that we felt comfortable, I started asking around and I found the Bright Hope care group. And it was definitely a wonderful resource and definitely a community that I felt God was working through and that it was a safe place to talk about issues that were hard to talk about. When we started going to Chapel Street, I think at one point in time, Jeff said, I don't think most of you, your problem is that there's some horrendous sin that you need to stop doing. And that kind of immediately connected with me, like, well, that's how I identify myself. There's this thing that I want to stop doing that I can't. And that's how I see myself and how I see that God sees me and how I think other people see me. And he said, I don't think that's, that's your problem. Your problem is that you don't see yourself the way God sees you. I was definitely in a, an extremely shameful place where everything that I'd been doing was now revealed. What I continued to hear was that healing was going to come by revealing more. And eventually through Compass being there over time, I rediscovered my genuine desire that I had to do the right thing, to have a relationship with God, and to be done with all the sin that I've been living in. My depression and anxiety and past scars really kind of undermined what I knew to be true, that I was loved and that you know God saved me and that he really wants the best for me. And you know, God is using care groups. We can show each other God's love and give each other our support and also to um, watch each other grow. And it's, it's really a special thing.
stories like that are why we say that the church is to be a place where you can experience grace and grow in faith and then make an impact. I thank uh, Sam and Zoe for sharing that part of their story. It's difficult to do, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of those stories happening right now and developing right now through the life of Chapel Street Church. Uh, And by the way, our care group registrations are open right now, so if you know someone or are aware of a friend who's going through a difficult stage, pick up a brochure today, look on the website, help them uh, understand that there is a group they can go to where they will be loved and cared for and helped through that season of your journey. One more little reminder for all of you here at South Street Campus, we begin our fall schedule next Sunday, so service will be at 9.15, not 10 o'clock, so we'll see you at 9.15 next Sunday morning. Well, as many of you know, I spent <clears throat> the first eight years or so of my time here at Chapel Street, formerly FBCG, uh, as a youth pastor. So I was working with high school kids and middle school kids. And one of my favorite uh, memories from that season of life was developing what we called at the time the bike trip. It was an annual week-long or nine-day-long trip to Colorado we were, where we rode bikes in the mountains. And I think we did it for eight straight years. Uh, we started with about 10 people willing to try that, ended up with about 50 students and adults. We packed up Greyhound buses, packed up a trailer full of bicycles, and carted everybody out to Colorado, to Breckenridge, where we started. And we'd ride 50 miles a day or so for a week to places like Aspen and Vail and, and Twin Lakes. And uh, we would stay at churches every night. And it was just a great week of physical challenge and uh, spiritual growth. Uh, this photo here was taken on top of Independence Pass by a group that went one of the last years that we went. Some of those folks are still in the church today. Um, and it was, Independence Pass was at an elevation of about 12,000 feet. We rode every single foot of that elevation. Uh, my wife rode with us that year. And if you want to ask her how much fun that was, <laughs> <laughs> she's here today. She can tell you all about that. I, it really almost, almost ended our marriage uh, there. <laughs> but <clears throat> the trip was fun. But it was also dangerous. So one of the big things we had to do initially was to teach kids how to ride safely because we rode on roads a lot. So we take the whole first day just to teach how to ride safely in groups. Uh, and you'll, this is how we, this is not one of our groups, but we taught kids to ride this way because you were safer on the road if you were in a group, not by yourself. But to ride in a group, it was important that they learn to communicate with each other. The, the lead rider was the one who could see everything, everything coming up ahead, and everybody behind the lead rider was looking at the back or the back side of the person in front of them. And so the lead rider had to communicate, you know, uh, rocks ahead, rider ahead, cars ahead, uh, holes in the road, potholes. And so they always had to communicate using hand signals and voice signals. And everybody had to pay attention. And everybody had to pass the word back. Well, at one point, uh, we, we left the road to ride on a bike trail, a paved bike trail. But there was a place where the bike trail crossed a little frontage road. And they had, there, we, there was a... a, a a concrete post planted right in the middle of the bike trail, probably to keep cars from turning onto the bike trail from the frontage road. It was painted black for some reason. So this one group is riding on the, on the, the bike trail, and the lead rider sees the post up ahead and gives the command backward, post right, post right, because we're right on the left-hand side of it. By about the third rider, for some reason, that word post turned into hole. So the, about the third rider goes hole right, and everyone after that started looking down for the hole. Well, you can see what happened. The fourth rider in, rider in line ran square on into that concrete pole, bent the frame of his bicycle. The four riders behind piled up onto him. We had this big pileup of, of, of twisted up broken bikes. Nobody broke any bones, but there were some skinned knees and scraped elbows, all because of one word, the power of one Word. And that's where I want to start today, because words matter. Our words matter. We're in a summer-long series called The Disciplines of Grace, and we've been developing um, healthy spiritual habits all summer. Habits like gratitude and generosity. Last week we talked about remembering. Remembering what, who God is and what He's done. And I gave you a challenge to kind of review your story. Make sure people that you care about know your faith journey story. Maybe think about a little symbol of that story you could put somewhere publicly. Uh, Lorraine and I spent time, I think it was last Sunday night, with two of our boys just reviewing our stories to make sure they knew, which they kind of did, but it was good to refresh, and we heard theirs. And I actually heard some things as dad I didn't really know clearly from my own son's faith stories. 
So remembering, we did that last week. Today we're going to talk about the discipline of speaking or the discipline of blessing. One, uh, you can call it both things. So why do we need discipline in our speaking? Well, James, in his new, uh, letter in the New Testament, tells us exactly why. Let me read these verses to you. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. James writes, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So James is simply saying that one of the main ways we stumble as believers, followers of Jesus, has to do with the way we speak, the words that we speak. Verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupted the whole body, it corrupts the whole body, and sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So, James is warning us about the power of the tongue, about the power of our words, uh, what we say. And he's acknowledging that it's difficult sometimes to control our tongues for all of us. And he's warning about the power words have to destroy. It's, it's as if I thought this week reading this, as if James, who lived in the first century, uh, had visited us in our culture in modern 21st century America. It's as if he had visited and listened to our public discourse. What's going on right now in our culture where we live? We live in a word world where words are increasingly used as, as weapons of sort. They're used as racial weapons, political weapons, even religious weapons. We live in a world where it's become necessary, and think about this, it's become necessary to write laws to prohibit what we now call hate speech. We have hate speech laws in our country. James says it should not be so. It shouldn't be like that, especially among those of you who call yourself by the name of Jesus. We are not to speak words that inflame, words that destroy, words that curse. And that's obvious. But how are we to speak? What's the flip side of that? So I'm going to jump over to the Apostle Paul and see what he has to say in the letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Listen to these words. Paul writes, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I'm going to read more of that passage in just a minute, but let me stop there. Uh, our words, Paul says, are to reflect the spiritual reality, the spiritual truth that by faith we have been made new. So that's the first thing I want to talk about today. What does it mean to be made new? I shared before here that uh, over the years that my dad was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, in fact, his two older brothers uh, eventually struggled greatly with alcoholism and died in their 40s as a result of their alcoholism. And he suspects he was headed down the same exact path um, until he was about 16 years old and two of his high school football buddies invited him to a Methodist revival meeting uh, where he met Jesus and his life was changed. However, an interesting part of, his, part of his story is just a few weeks prior to that event when these buddies invited him, and he met Jesus, he had another experience that, that served in a way to really pique his curiosity. And that story had to do with a, a date he was on with a young woman in his high school. Uh, they were going out on a date, and this particular young woman had um, something of a reputation with the boys in his high school, which was part of the reason why he was interested in her. I want to be gentle and careful about this story. Well, as they got in the car and had on this date, First thing she said when she got in the car was, uh, you need to know something, I think. He said, oh, what's that? She goes, well, last week I gave my life to Jesus, and there are certain things I don't do anymore. 
In other words, she had been made new. This is why, by the way, when we baptize folks here at Chapel Street now, we give them these t-shirts to wear before or afterward. They say made new. Did you see the little graphic on the video? This, over this past year, 199 people uh, took the step of being baptized, which is, uh, I think, an all I'm pretty sure an all-time record in one year at Chapel Street. In fact, Jeff was frustrated because he wanted one more person to make a round number of, of, of 200. But made new. The phrase made new points us to the promise of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Now what is the new creation? What does that mean? New what? I like to summarize it by saying we are promised four news. A new heart, first of all, through the forgiveness of sin. Hearts washed clean by the blood of Christ. And most of us who've been around church most of our lives and heard the gospel, we get this part of it. We know, believe in Jesus, because he forgives your sins, he went to the cross for your sins. We get it. But that's not all the gospel promises. Also promises us new identity. We're no longer slaves to sin. This is what Sam was talking about in the video. We're no longer slaves. We are adopted as sons and daughters. We'll talk more about identity in just a moment. And that's not even all. We're also promised new purpose. That is to live and serve in his eternal kingdom, which is why some, something near a thousand of us served, all day, served half a day yesterday out in our community. It's just we are given a new purpose, and that's not all. We're also promised a new destiny. That is eternal life in the new heaven and new earth, reigning and ruling with Jesus himself. So if you've put your faith in Christ, these four promises are yours. New heart, new identity, new purpose, and new destiny. Let me go back to new identity for a moment. Last week I talked a bit about this, but identity is simply um, what we think about ourselves. And it's talked, a lot about, talked about a lot in our culture today. It's what you think about yourself. Uh, and it's one of the most important things about you. And identity comes from one of three places in our experience. Your sense of identity can come from first the people around you, your family, your friends, your culture, the people around you tell you who you are, or it can come from inside you. You decide who you are. You decide who you want to be, and that's, by the way, the gospel of our culture today is you determine your own identity. Or thirdly, it comes from the one who created you in his own image. It comes from the God who created you. Paul says, put off your old self, which has been corrupted by sinful desires, put on the new self, which is created to be like God, listen, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, which means, ultimately, a new way of living, new behavior, a new way of understanding yourself, a new way of living in the world, including a new way of speaking. That's, but it, that's where it starts in being made new. Secondly, I want to talk today about new speech, a new way of speaking. When I was uh, very young, and some of you will remember the story, maybe I was four or five years old, we lived in Louisville, Kentucky. My favorite TV show as a little boy was um, a cowboy show called uh, T-Bar V Ranch. It was a local show in Louisville. Um, if, how many of you remember Roy Rogers? Remember the Roy Rogers show? <laughs> okay. Well, T Bar V Ranch was sort of a poor man's version of Roy Rogers. It was a little local thing. It was a singing cowboy named Randy Atcher, and he had a sidekick named Cactus. And I watched it every day after school, or after kindergarten, or, or maybe I wasn't even in kindergarten, four or five years old. But I watched it every day. I loved, I loved that little show. And somehow, my parents um, found a way to get me in the studio audience. They took me to the taping of that show. Uh, one time. So I'm in the studio audience, not no, and none of us knew that at some point they actually invited random kids up onto the stage to, for, to be interviewed by the star of the show, by Cowboy Randy. And I got randomly chosen at age five to go up on stage at the taping of this TV show. And so I'm sitting on the little stool there, and when he went to talk to me, he asked me a question. The question he asked was, so, Brian, have you ever been fishing? Now, I had never been fishing my whole life. I didn't really even know what it was. And, but something in my five-year-old brain told me that saying no would have been the wrong answer or embarrassing. And so 
I needed to pad my resume a little bit. So I said yes. To my parents' great surprise, I said yes, and I caught a shark this big, I said. <laughs> Only kind of fish I could think of, I guess, under pressure. Thus bringing shame and embarrassment on my entire extended family who was watching the TV show. Paul writes, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are, we are all members of one body. One of the results, he's saying, one of the marks of being made new in Christ is the manner in which we speak, the words that we say. And Paul actually goes on to give us three changes in the way that we speak. First, he says, put off falsehood and speak truthfully. Now, for the majority of our lives, almost everyone in this room, um, we've been able to trust what we call the news. That is, watching the evening news, reading the daily newspaper. How many of you remember Walter Cronkite? Remember Walter Cronkite? Remember growing up watching him on the news, right? For decades, he was known as the most trusted man in America. Because if he said it, it was the way it was. But somewhere along the line, we lost that sense of trust. We've lost that sense of confidence. Now what we hear about is, is quote-unquote, fake news. And most of us now assume that whatever news we see, whether we listen to it on, on radio, watch it on TV, read about it in newspapers, has been, has been bent in some way or has been somehow distorted by, by some sort of political agenda and so that we don't really know who to trust. We don't really know who's telling us the truth anymore. And that's the issue what Paul's getting at, the issue of trust. Now, we all know that it's human nature to distort the truth. Uh, it's human nature to hide the truth, to lie, to put it bluntly. Interesting, as parents, those of you who are parents know, you don't have to, you don't have to teach your children how to lie. We have to teach our children not to lie because it's human nature. We misrepresent the truth. We have this tendency to hide the truth, to pretend to be what we are not in order to protect ourselves, uh, to avoid getting into trouble, uh, to be seen as better than we are. Some examples. We fudge the truth by padding our resume, as I did as a five-year-old on a TV show. Or we, a friend asks us how we're doing, and we say, fine, even though we're struggling with significant issues that we need help with. Uh, or we're te and we're tempted to, to hide behind falsehood out of, out of fear, really. We are fearful that if we speak the truth, we'll be embarrassed. If we speak the truth, we'll get in trouble. If we speak the truth, we won't be loved or accepted. So at the root of our fear is the inability to or the failure to trust God and what he's already done for us. Paul says, in Christ, you have been made new. You can live in truth because you're already loved. His love will never change. It will never go away. It's permanent. You're already forgiven. It's what Sam was talking about in the video. You've already been adopted as sons. You're, you've already been given a new purpose, a new destiny. So you don't have to hide. You don't have to live in fear. A while back, I saw a cute little story about a, a nine-year-old Little League baseball player. I watch a lot of baseball. You know I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Uh, little baseball player's name was Billy, nine years old, playing a Little League game, and he was running to third base. He slid in. The umpire said, um, safe. And Billy stood up and said, sir, no. He tagged me. I'm out. So the umpire said, you're out. A couple weeks later, Billy's playing in another game. This time he's running toward home plate. Same umpires at the game, calling the game behind home plate. Billy slides in. The umpire says, you're out. And Billy stands up and says, sir, he didn't tag me. I'm safe. And the umpire looks at him and goes, okay, you're safe. <laughs> the other coach runs out of the dugout, wants to argue the call. You can't. He goes, coach, stop right there. Don't even bother arguing. I know Billy, and Billy always tells the truth. He's safe. <laughs> huh? So the question is, are our words trustworthy? Do we trust the promises of God enough to be people of truth? Can we be trusted? Secondly, Paul warns us about words spoken in anger. Words spoken in anger. I spent 
uh, 17 days in July traveling in Turkey and Africa, visiting some of our Serve the World partners. And one of my stops was in Istanbul, where I visited with Pastor Ali Kalkandela and, and uh, his church. And I met one night with a group of about 10 younger new believers, uh, and just to hear their stories, to encourage them a little bit. And I'll, I'll tell some of their stories later, as I'm sure, as we go through the fall. Just, just uh, amazing stories, heartbreaking stories. But at the end of that time together, they had some refreshments. And one of the things they brought out uh, was a, a, a traditional Turkish beverage uh, that they were all really quite proud of. And I don't remember the Turkish word for it, but it was translated. If you translated it directly into English, the translation was fermented hot red beet juice. Does that sound good to you? <laughs> it was worse than it sounds. It, it was horrific. And it, it, it took all my self-control not to just gag and spit it right back out. It was just disgusting. Um, I can't begin to describe the rancid bitterness. But James here says uh, words sometimes are like that. They can be bitter and poisonous. James chapter 3, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on, by, set, set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. And no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, James doesn't say this specifically, but I think he might have in mind words spoken in anger. Because words spoken in anger are poisonous. Some of you grew up as children hearing these kinds of words in your home. And you can still remember those words. You're worthless. You're lazy. You'll never amount to anything. You're ugly. Paul says, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. See, anger as an emotion is not sinful. Anger as an emotion is sometimes quite appropriate. However, words spoken in anger are almost always destructive, almost always poisonous, and almost always sinful. We're to avoid them, Paul says. Thirdly, he says we are to avoid unwholesome talk. Unwholesome talk. Talk. When I was in about the second grade, on the playground one day, I heard a boy use a word I'd never heard before. Uh, I didn't know what the word meant. I just knew it had quite an impact on the playground. So all day long, I pondered that word uh, and couldn't wait to get a chance to try it out myself. So I got home, immediately ran up to my bedroom, second floor, opened the window, and shouted this word out to our neighborhood as loud as I could. You probably already guessed. It was a it was a four-letter word rhyming with the word spit. And I learned pretty quickly through the swift reaction of my mother that that's not a word we used in our house. I think that reaction involved soap, uh, maybe a paddle, I can't quite remember. Uh, but I learned that we don't talk that way. And more importantly, I learned that Christians don't talk that way. Paul says, do not let the unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, the Greek word translated unwholesome here is the word sapros. It means corrupt or rotten or putrid, overripe. It's the kind of word you would use for rotting vegetables or produce or even for animal waste. Okay, it's a powerful word. Uh, last week, uh, Lorraine and I had, dinner, had, had chicken for dinner one night, and we cut up the chicken, and we threw the, the leftover kind of raw chicken that we didn't, ba uh, didn't grill into a, a bag and threw it in the garbage. And it was warm last week. Put it outside in our garbage can, and a couple days later we noticed this horrible smell in our, gar in our garage, and she looked in, I, I, was, I was gone, she looked in and noticed, and it was the chicken. In the heat, there were maggots, and it was disgusting, and she, we had to have the whole can fumigated, cleaned out, and all that. But that's what the word means, okay? It means ugly and corrupt. And our speech should not be that way. Our, we should not use words that are rotten or phrases that are rotten. All those who have been made new in Christ have speech that is different. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And I think Paul would assume that thinking about that such things means speaking 
such things as are lovely, right, noble, and pure. In other words, we are to speak words that bless. That's the third point today, words that bless. Uh, my dad has a lifelong habit of memorizing Scripture. Now, some people find memorizing hard. My dad has always been able to memorize things. Um, in fact, my dad at one point in his life had memorized over 100 chapters of Scripture. Not verses, chapters. And he sort of loved to demonstrate this gift to you when you ask and sometimes when you didn't ask. And, and he would get started and I'd be like, oh, man, it's going to be a while because he could just go and go and go. Well, one day, uh, a few years ago, a number of years ago now, he was in a supermarket or a, grocery st- or a department store or something and he was in a checkout line. And it was, the checkout line was really long. Maybe they only had one or two open. I don't remember the whole situation. But, but people were irritated and getting more irritated. And he could overhear the way people were treating the cashier. Uh, just, there, were a lot, there were just uh, angry words spoken, frustrated words spoken. And she was kind of being, being uh, uh, abused, more or less, by the customers, who were all frustrated. So by the time he got there with whatever he was buying, uh, he said she looked at him uh, with... Uh, look, and looked like she, she was stressed and bedraggled. And she looked at him, a total stranger, and said, say something nice. And my dad, without hesitation, launched into Psalm 103 because he had it memorized. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He said at that moment her face softened, <coughs> excuse me, and tears came to her eyes. And she said, is there more? That's beautiful. <laughs> she didn't know him. He continued, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm sure people are standing in line going, what's this guy talking about? (laughs) But he was able to speak words of blessing to a total stranger. Our words are not to be unwholesome, not to be bitter, not to be hurtful, not to be poisonous. Our words are to bless. Again, Paul, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Our words are not to tear down, not to spread corruption and rottenness, rather to build up, to encourage, to benefit, or to bless. Now, what kinds of words do that? What kinds of words bless? Paul continues, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, and all those words associated with those things. Verse 32, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It's not rocket science, but it's difficult. Words that are kind and and compassionate. Some time ago, I came across a story, maybe it was sent to me by someone here in church, Um, but it's a beautiful example of words that bless and build up. It's a little piece written by a woman named Marianne Bird. She's looking back on her life, a memory. She writes, I grew up knowing I was different, and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate, And when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When schoolmates asked, what happened to your lip? I'd tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could ever love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored. Mrs. Leonard was her name. She was short, round, happy, a sparkling lady. Well, every year we had a hearing test, and Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that we'd stand against the door and cover one ear, and the teacher was sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we'd have to repeat it back. She'd say things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words that God must have put into her mouth, seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl, she said. 
That's what it means to speak words that bless. The teacher didn't have to say those words that maybe don't come naturally to us, but she chose to. Words that are kind and compassionate. Words that God himself would say. Every week we've been giving you something to think about, something to, to challenge yourself on, spiritually speaking. And so what I want you to think about this week is pretty simple. Uh, spend some time thinking about the words that you speak. If you've been made new in Christ, you put your faith in him, uh, everything about you is new. And your speech is to be new. Are your words, are our words trustworthy and true? Do you have a habit of speaking in anger? Or do you have a little habit of you know, being critical, complaining? Uh, do your words ever have a little poison tucked away in them? Do your words bless and build up? Are your words intentionally kind and intentionally compassionate? Just spend time thinking and doing an inventory of your, of your words, your language, your patterns, your habits. And then here's the challenge. See if you can... Find someone every day this week to offer words of intentional blessing to in some way. Just some intentional way to bless someone every day with your words. Maybe it's the waiter or waitress at your favorite coffee shop or restaurant. You know, and you say something like, hey, thank you for serving me today. You do a great job. Just wanted to tell you that I hope you have a great day. Or if you're bold, you quote Psalm 103 to them. <laughs> they might look at you a little funny. Or maybe it's a written email or a written, handwritten note to a grandchild or a son or daughter, reminding them how much they're loved by God. Notes can have powerful impact. Maybe to a family member, somebody you live with, maybe to a total stranger. You never know when your word of encouragement, when your simple word of kindness, your simple word of blessing might be used by God to change the course of a person's life. That's your challenge for this week. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord God, thank you today for the reminder that by your grace, we can be and are made new. It teaches that your grace makes all things new, even the way we speak, the words we use. And may our words not be words that hurt, tear down, belittle, May our words not be words spoken in anger or words that are rotten. Rather, teach us to speak that which is true and trustworthy. Teach us to speak that which builds up. Teach us to speak that which is kind and encouraging and compassionate. Teach us to speak words that bless. We pray these things in your name. Amen.